New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. But, Nick, that's fantastic. No one would cooperate in his own murder. Maybe fantastic, Patsy, but all the evidence points to it. Then I don't believe the evidence. Well, there's only one way to prove what really happened. It's a method I hate to use. Why, Nick? Because it puts an innocent person in danger. But we haven't any choice now. We've got to go through with it. Now, the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Even though she's 79 years old and confined to a wheelchair, old Mrs. Wright still enjoys picnics. And since her two great-grandnephews, John and Charles, expect to inherit the Wright Pharmaceutical Company one day, they're always willing to go along. One day early last fall, Charles' wife, Janet, wheeled old Mrs. Wright to the picnic grounds in a secluded corner of the estate and stopped the chair near the edge of a cliff overhanging the river. How's this, Aunt Madge? Just fine, Janet. Oh, I've always loved this view, looking down at the river, mm. like being on top of the world. It is beautiful. Where are the boys? They went back into the woods looking for dead branches to build a fire with wine. I wear my shawl, but you might know he wouldn't be around when I need him. I'll get it for you. Around when I need him. I'll get it for you, Aunt Madge. Thank you, Janet. I'll be right back. Huh. Oh, still wish she'd married Johnny instead of Charles. Oh, well. This is a beautiful spot up here where the sun's... Uh, uh, ah, Johnny, take your hand away from my eyes. I know it's you. Where are you wheeling me to, Johnny? Johnny! Charles! Johnny! Take your hand off my eyes. I... Oh, no! Oh! <laughs> America, you didn't drown, Mrs. Wright. If those two fishermen hadn't seen you fall in and got to you in time... Well, they did. Are you sure you're well enough to talk, Mrs. Wright? Yes, of course I am. But, Aunt Madge, you know what Dr. Myron said about your heart. No, pneumonia left this week. May quit any time. All the more reason this thing has to be settled now. But, Aunt Madge, I Mr. don't... Mr. Carter, I sent for you to tell you someone has tried to murder me. You mean someone deliberately pushed your wheelchair over the cliff? Exactly. But, Aunt Madge, no one was near that part of the estate but John and Charles and me, and the boys were in the woods gathering firewood. I know it wasn't you, Janet. Well, that was a man's hand over my eyes, and Johnny wouldn't hurt me. He loves his old aunt. Then you think it was your other nephew, Charles? I know it was, and I want you to prove it, Mr. Carter. Well, I'm afraid you're asking the impossible, Mrs. Wright. Why? Well, don't you see? This all happened three weeks ago. Even if there were any clues, they'd, they'd be gone by now. Then investigate Charles. You'll find something I'll be bound. I don't understand you, Aunt Madge. Talking about your own nephew like this, and in front of me, his wife. I'd just as soon say it to his face. Even as a boy, Charles used to sneak lie and steal money out of my purse. I could see the difference between him and Johnny even then. You've never given Charles a chance. I put them both through the same school, didn't I? Trained them both to be chemists so they could take over the business together someday, didn't I? And what happened? Charles went into real estate. With no more reason than that, you're accusing him of... Oh, Aunt Madge, you're being unfair. All right. I'll show you whether I'm unfair or not. Mr. Carter, I want you to investigate both Charles and John. Very well, Mrs. Wright. And let me know what you find out as soon as you can. I will. In the meantime, be careful. <laughs> he won't try it again. I fixed that. You fixed it? How? My lawyer was here this morning, and I changed my will. You did what? Changed my will. The way it stands now, I'm leaving everything to John. Aunt Madge, how could you? Maybe I'll change it back later. I want Charles to know that if anything happens to me before I do, <laughs> he won't get a red cent. Oh, 
back so soon, Carter? It's only been three days, hasn't it? Well, there wasn't a great deal to find out. How nice you look, Mrs. Wright. You must be feeling a lot better. I wouldn't be out of bed if I wasn't. <laughs> this is Aunt Madge's 80th birthday, and we're getting ready to have a little party. Oh, never mind that, Janet. I want to hear what Carter found out. Well, frankly, Mrs. Wright, what I've learned doesn't prove a thing. I'll decide that. Okay. First of all, your nephew, John Wright, seems to be a pretty steady young fellow. No bad habits or associates, lives within his income, saves regularly, and so on. I could have told you that. What about Charles? Well, Patsy can read that part of the report to you. Go ahead, Patsy. Right, Nick. Charles Wright, credit rating very poor. Business, heavily mortgaged. Overdue loan at the First Community Bank. Several large personal loans. I don't see any reason for parading Charles' business difficulties here. Be Janet. What else, young lady? Three days before Mrs. Wright's accident, Charles Wright attempted to consolidate his debts with a loan from the Halliday Trust Company, offering as security the fact that he would soon inherit half the estate of his aunt, who was very ill and could not possibly live long. Ah, uh, couldn't possibly live long. Well, he did his best to make sure such a thing. Mrs. Wright, it'd be very unfair to condemn anyone on such flimsy evidence. No, it only confirms what I thought before. Janet, if you want... Janet... If you want to live here with me, you're welcome. But I want Charles to pack up and get out today. Good Aunt Madge, your birthday party. My mind's made up. Mrs. Wright, as a favor to me, go on downstairs. Have your birthday party and don't say anything to either John or Charles until tomorrow. Sleep on it first. Well... Please, Aunt Madge, try to be fair. Oh, there goes that word fair again. All right, I won't say anything until tomorrow. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Oh, Happy stop birthday it. Stop it. Stop it. You know I don't like all this fuss. <laughs> you love it, Aunt Madge. Huh? Now, come on. Open your present. Open this one first, Aunt Madge. Yes, it's from Charles and me. I can read the card, can't I? Hey, an amethyst brooch. That's good looking. Uh, very pretty. Thank you, Janet. Uh, you too, Charles. Well, I'm glad you like her, Aunt Madge. Don't talk with your mouth full, Charles. I should think three pieces of cake would be enough for you anyway. I'm afraid my gift will look pretty sad after that, Aunt Madge. But anyway, here it is. With all my love. Ah, you know I like it, Johnny, whatever it is. Well, a music box. It's beautiful, Johnny. Well, open the lid. <gasps> How thoughtful of you. But where are my chocolates? Your what? Ah, now, stop teasing. You know you always give me a box of those special Swiss chocolates on my birthday. Well, you know, I have to order them from Switzerland, and this year it just slipped my mind. Oh, I don't believe it. What's that you're holding behind your back? <laughs> <laughs> Can't fool you, can I, Aunt Madge? Here, and many happy returns of the day. Ah, you can. <laughs> uh, my birthday just wouldn't be complete without these. Aren't they pretty? They always look as good as they taste. Here, I'll put them away for you, Aunt Madge. You know the doctor said no sweets for a while. Oh, Janet, give me those chocolates. But Aunt Madge, mm, the doctor They do look said... good, don't they? <laughs> Glad I'm not on a diet. Charles, put that back. Those chocolates are for Aunt Madge. Yeah, well, too late now. I only took one anyway. Oh, you ought to be ashamed, Charles. Hmm. Doesn't taste so hot. Kind of... Her. Hand me that box, Janet, before he eats the rest of them. Well, all right, but... And Madge, we're... don't... Don't eat those. What? Charles, what's the matter? That chocolate. Something wrong. I feel... <clears throat> Charles! Within seconds of eating one of his Aunt Madge's birthday chocolates, Charles Wright collapses. And even before Janet can reach her husband's side, he's dead. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. An hour has passed, and Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is at the Wright Mansion with Nick and Patsy, trying to arrive at the facts of Charles' death. A medical examiner says there must have been enough cyanide in that piece of candy to kill half a dozen men. But it couldn't have been the chocolate, Sergeant. You stop pretending, John. This is one thing you can't blame Charles for. Well, I'm not trying to, but I could If Aunt Madge had eaten that chocolate before she put Charles back in a will, you'd have inherited everything. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Janet, stop it. I won't stop. You've always protected and petted him. Now you know who tried to kill you last Aunt month. Aunt Madge, I swear I don't know anything about it. Liar, liar, liar. Charles always had to take the blame for what you did. And even as he was dying, he tried to warn us. 
last night. All right, all right. Now, hold everything just a minute. Uh, Mr. Wright, why do you say the chocolates couldn't have been poisoned? Because they arrived by registered mail from Switzerland only this afternoon. I didn't even have time to unwrap the package before I gave it to Aunt Madge. The wrappings could have been taken off and put back again. Of course they couldn't. That's exactly what he did. I did not. If there was poison in those chocolates, somebody else put it there. Oh, sure, sure. As a biochemist, Mr. Wright, you have access to cyanide, don't you? Well, yes, but so do lots of people. And when Charles started to eat that chocolate, you tried to stop him, didn't you? I, I don't remember. I do. He said, put it back, Charles. Those chocolates are for Aunt Madge. Uh-huh. Well, I think we've heard enough. Come on, young fella. Come on where? To headquarters. Where do you think? I'm booking you for murder. We have to wait here at the post office very long. No, no. Maddie said he'd phone ahead and get an okay for us to look at that receipt. Good. Oh, here's the inquiry window over here. Well, I hope the sergeant didn't forget to phone. Uh, yes, sir? My name's Nick Carter. I came to see you about a receipt for a registered package from Switzerland. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I have it right here. The assistant postmaster said you'd be calling for it. Thanks. Oh. Why, Nick? John Wright didn't sign for the chocolate. Oh, the name seems to be... Yvette Fouchard. Yvette Fou... Why, that's Mrs. Wright's personal maid. Uh-huh. And look at the date. Yesterday. Then John was lying. He had that package a whole day before the party. It looks that way. But before we make up our minds, let's talk to Yvette. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, I signed the, what you call him, the, the certificate? The receipt. Oh, oui, mademoiselle. I sign him, then I place the package on the old table where Monsieur Jean is sure to see him. Not a half hour have passed until I hear the voice of Monsieur Jean greeting Madame, and I say to myself, why he is home so early, huh? And why was he? Madame, see, he have a headache. But what about the package? When I put the regular mail on the hall table about three o'clock, the chocolates are gone. Monsieur Jean had taken them. But you didn't see him do it. No, monsieur. But the package is there when he come home. It is gone after he passed through the hall. So I know he had find it. <laughs> Isn't it funny, Nick? The smartest men make stupid mistakes when they try to commit a crime. John left a trail of evidence a yard wide. How about you forgetting, Patsy, that if Mrs. Wright had eaten that chocolate, there probably wouldn't have been any investigation. You mean because of her weak heart? Sure. Everyone would have assumed that death was due to heart failure. <sighs> well, what now, Nick? Let's get on to headquarters and see what the laboratory boys have found out. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Nick. That box of candy was more interesting than we thought. How do you mean, Sergeant? Well, first of all, Patsy, the poison must have been put in with a hypodermic needle. The lab boys found marks like pinholes in the bottom of every chocolate. Nothing unusual about that, Matty? No, but what was unusual was the cyanide itself, Nick. In the lower layer, he used a solution so weak, it wouldn't have killed anybody but a person with a bad heart like Mrs. Wright. Well, what do you mean, in the lower layer? <laughs> That's just it, Patsy. He gave the top layer a solution ten times as strong, enough to kill anybody. Hey, that is interesting. Yeah, and that's not all. There were some impurities in that cyanide, Nick. That'll be a cinch to prove where it came from once we locate the original supply. Yeah, sure. Chemical analysis should take care of that. Yeah, but the most important thing of all was a fingerprint. Whose fingerprint? I don't know yet, Patsy, but I bet it's John's. The chocolate must have got soft while he was holding it to put the poison in. Have you checked it against John's prints? Yeah, the boys are doing that now, Nick. Matty, where was the chocolate with the fingerprint on it? Top or bottom layer? Uh, the bottom. And that layer hadn't been touched until we got the box down here to the lab. So he can't claim that it got there by accident after the box was open. Now, you're right about that. Could I go down to the lab and take a look at the chocolates myself? Sure you can, Nick. What for? I'd like to find out why the top layer was given a double dose. Sergeant Matheson was right, Nick. All these chocolates had the same kind of little pinholes in the bottom. No, no, not quite the same, Patsy. Look at these chocolates from the top layer. 
Holes are larger and not quite so regular. Well? Looks to me as though someone had put a second dose of cyanide in these and tried to insert the needle in the holes left by the first one. What? It does look that way. That's why the poison was stronger in the top layer. Why, of course. He decided that perhaps the weak solution wouldn't actually kill her, so he gave the chocolates on top another dose with a stronger solution. Perhaps. But why insert the needle in exactly the same place? Why not? Look at the pattern on the bottom of each piece of candy. The pinhole is right in the middle of that little dimple where you can hardly see it. It's the logical place to put the needle. You know, Patsy, I'm beginning to wonder whether that second dose of poison might not have been put in by somebody else. What? You mean two different people had the same idea at almost the same time? Could be. And both of them tried to kill Mrs. Wright with the same kind of poison in the same box of chocolate? Oh, Nick, that that's too much of a coincidence. Well, stranger things than that have happened, Patsy. Let's visit John Wright's laboratory. I want to find out if the cyanide really did come from there. <laughs> Here's the only bottle of cyanide we have, Mr. Carter, but we don't use it because it's not a very good grade. Some kind of impurities in it. I don't know exactly what. Impurities? Nick, do you remember what the sergeant said? Yeah, I know what you mean, Patsy. Must be an interesting job, Mr. Jensen, laboratory assistant to a biochemist. Oh, the work's interesting enough. You don't happen to be working for a slave driver like John Wright. Oh, uh, don't you like him? Well, John's all right, I guess. For sure, a lot pleasanter working for Charles. You mean Charles used to be a chemist here, too? Oh, yes, yes. Before he went into real estate, I was his assistant then, and Janet worked with John. Then after John broke their engagement and Janet married Charles... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is getting complicated. Janet and John were engaged. Oh, yes, yes. But he changed his mind. Everybody thinks she broke it off. I know different. John just let her say that to save her feelings. Then Charles was Janet's second choice, huh? Yes, that's right. Have you seen either of them lately? Uh, yes, yes. They were both up one day last week talking over old times. I see. Well, thanks for the information, Mr. Jensen. It's helped a lot. Uh, here's the report on that cyanide comparison test, Nick. Okay, let's see it. Here you are. Both of them analyzed exactly the same. Then the cyanide and the chocolates came from John Wright's laboratory. Not a doubt in the world, Patsy. Well, how about the fingerprint on that chocolate? Ah, we drew a blank there. Maybe it belongs to somebody in the candy factory in Switzerland. Anyway, it's not John Wright's. Uh, could it belong to someone else in the Wright household? Well, Patsy, the fingerprint boys are checking that now, but it, that's just routine. That print had to be made by either the poisoner or somebody in Switzerland. Nobody else had a chance to touch that bottom layer of candy. I'm beginning to get an idea, Matty. Huh? Pretty fantastic, but... Oh, excuse me. Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, yeah, Barker. Is it the report? Yeah, Patsy. What? Barker, you made a mistake. Oh, no, no. No, you must have. Yeah, but... Okay. Okay, Barker. Whose print was it, Sergeant? Nick, do you know who poisoned those chocolates? I think I do. Same guy that ate one of them and died, Charles Wright. Charles, oh, go on it, Nick, you're right. It was his fingerprint. Oh, but if Charles poisoned the chocolates, he must have known what he was doing when he ate one of them. Uh, yeah, Nick. Are you trying to tell me the guy committed suicide just so he could frame John for murder? No, Matty, I think Charles Wright cooperated in his own murder. Huh? And I'm afraid by doing so, he made it impossible for us to get one shred of evidence that'll convict the real killer. Well, do you know who it is, Nick? I think I do. There's only one way to prove it. How? Method I hate to use, Matty. Because it may be pretty dangerous for an innocent person. <laughs> wanted to see me, Aunt Madge, so I... What in the world are you doing with these two laundry hampers here in your room? I'm looking for something with a chocolate stain on it. Here, Janet, you look through this hamper. Chocolate stain? What do you mean? The chocolate was soft, and whoever poisoned those candies must have got some of it on his fingers. It would be the most natural thing in the world to wipe them off on something without even thinking about it. Aunt Madge, John poisoned them. You know that. All right. 
Then if we find chocolates on one of his handkerchiefs, that will prove it. Oh, it's just a waste of time, Aunt Man. Maybe, but... <gasps> Did you find something? Uh, no. No, I didn't find a thing. And why are you looking so funny? I'm not. I'm not looking funny at all. I... Janet, would you run downstairs and ask Harvey to bring up some tea? You're just making an excuse to get me out of the room, aren't you, Aunt Madge? I know, Janet. Why should I? Why? So you can make a telephone call to Nick Carter. Oh, what an idea. Why should I want... Because you did find something in that clothes hamper. You're trying to hide... Why should I want... Because you did find something in that clothes hamper. You're trying to hide it under... Oh, the... Why, Janet, so... One of my handkerchiefs. And there is a smear of chocolate on it. I was more careless than I thought. And it was you. You did poison that candy. Of course I did. But you knew that if I died, everything would go to John. That's why I took the candy away from you before you had a chance to eat any of it. And that's why Charles grabbed the piece first. We had it planned very carefully. You mean Charles knew about the poison? Yes. But he thought there was only a tiny bit of it. Enough to make him convincingly sick. And make you think that dear Johnny was trying to kill you. Ah, now I'm beginning to understand. You thought that I'd blame Johnny for the other attempt, too. You thought I'd change my will and leave everything to Charles. Exactly, darling. But there was more poison in the chocolates than Charles thought. Because after he finished preparing them, I gave the top layer a second and stronger dose. Ah, I can't believe it. You loved Charles. I hated him. That greedy fool. I only married him because I thought he'd be rich someday. And then you will. Why, do? Why did you kill him, Janet? I, so that I'd get it all for myself. And be rid of him at the same time. With Charles dead and John convicted of his murder, who could you leave it to but me? The poor, sorrowing widow. I didn't know anybody could be so evil. Well, you know now, darling. Any more last words? Last words? Yes. You're about to die of heart failure, dear. No. You don't think I'll let you tell the police about finding that handkerchief, do you? But I was just... So if you don't... Hello, from behind your back. Yes. No, don't, please. You won't struggle much. Yes. Your heart won't last that long. Struggle much. Yes. Your heart won't last that long. All I need to do is press the pillow over your face. Yes. For a moment. Yes. Like this, that man. Yes. Like this. Yes. Weak and ill, Mrs. Wright hasn't the strength to defend herself against Janet's murderous attack. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Helpless in her wheelchair, Mrs. Wright struggles feebly against the suffocating pillow which Janet holds firmly over her face. Go on and die, you own. That's enough, Janet. I, where did you come from? We've been hiding in the closet, listening. Are you all right, Mrs. Wright? Yes, I, I'm quite all right, Mr. Carter. It was such an interesting confession, Janet. I'm sure the jury will enjoy it as much as we did when you go on trial for murder. <laughs> was Charles who pushed my wheelchair over that embankment, wasn't it, Mr. Carter? That's what Janet told us at headquarters. Well, that was Charles' own idea, but the poisoning scheme was Janet. I began to see through the plan when we found Charles' fingerprint on that chocolate. And obviously, Janet had to be in on the scheme, too. Why? Because when we found out that the chocolates had been poisoned the second time with a stronger solution, that made it pretty clear that somebody who knew what Charles had done was double-crossing him. And Janet was the most logical suspect. Yes, I suppose so. But we still didn't have any proof. Those things were only circumstantial evidence. Well, you had the handkerchief with the chocolate stain, Nick. <laughs> Shall we tell her, Mr. Carter? Might as well. There wasn't any chocolate stain, Patsy. There wasn't any... But there was. I saw it. I know. Maddie and I put it there ourselves. You... So that's why you went through all that rigmarole and let Mrs. Wright risk her life. Oh, 
I wasn't worried knowing you were all there in the closet. Oh. Anyway, it was worth it to prove that I wasn't wrong about Johnny. <laughs> well, now you can be satisfied that you put your faith in the right, Mr. Wright. <laughs> Well, Nick, what sort of an adventure does new post-war old Dutch cleanser have for us next week? Next week, Ralph, we're going after a young fellow I really liked. He was hiding out because of a murder committed back in 1939. And he admitted killing another man in 1948. And you liked him? Why, Nick? Well, if you ask me, Ralph, I think it was because when Nick tried to keep him from getting away, he threw Nick halfway across the room. Oh, that's a fine basis for a lasting friendship with a murderer. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Ralph, that was exactly what convinced me that he wasn't a murderer, in spite of his own admission. No, I still don't get it. But uh, what do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Forgetful Killer. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at the same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Ralph Camargo saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.